Welcome back to part two of our deep dive into the dark heart of Hitler's inner circle. In our last video, we uncovered the ruthless ambitions and chilling actions of three of the most powerful men in the Nazi regime. But there are others, figures who operated in the shadows, wielding influence that was just as deadly, if not more so. Today, we'll be pulling back the curtain on the secretive masterminds who orchestrated the Holocaust, managed Hitler's day-to-day -day affairs with an iron fist, and tried to escape justice in the aftermath of the war. These men played critical roles in the functioning of the Third Reich, making decisions that would lead to untold suffering and devastation. So who were these shadowy figures? And how did they rise to such power? Stay tuned as we continue to unravel the dark web of Nazi leadership. Before we start the video, don't forget to check out our selection of playlists. We cover other wars like Vietnam, the World Wars, as well as Viking and Roman times. We will also be adding to our collection soon. Make sure you like, subscribe, and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Now relax and enjoy the video. That's in order. Reinhard Heydrich, the Blonde Beast of the Nazi Regime Reinhard Heydrich, often referred to as the Butcher of Prague or the Blonde Beast, was one of the most feared and ruthless figures in Nazi Germany. A key architect of the Holocaust, Heydrich's cold, calculating nature and his pivotal role in the Nazi security apparatus made him a central figure in the regime's reign of terror. But who was this man, and how did he become the epitome of Nazi cruelty? Reinhard Heydrich was born on March 7, 1904, in Halle under Salle, Germany. His father was a composer and opera singer, and Heydrich grew up in a cultured and musical household. Despite this seemingly refined upbringing, Heydrich developed a reputation for being distant and aloof, traits that would characterize his later life. After serving in the German Navy, where he was dismissed following a scandal, Heydrich found his way into the Nazi party through his marriage to Lena von Osten, a fervent Nazi supporter. In 1931, Heinrich Himmler, recognizing Heydrich's talents, appointed him to head the fledgling intelligence service of the SS. This organization, which would later become the Reich Main Security Office, RHA, gave Heydrich the platform to exercise his meticulous and ruthless nature. Heydrich quickly proved himself indispensable to the Nazi leadership. He played a critical role in the Night of the Long Knives in 1934, where he orchestrated the purge of the SA leadership, ensuring the dominance of the SS. His ability to operate with cold efficiency earned him the trust of Himmler and Hitler, and he was soon involved in some of the regime's most nefarious activities. Heydrich's most infamous contribution to the Nazi regime was his role in the planning and execution of the Holocaust. In 1941, he was appointed by Hitler to oversee the final solution to the Jewish question. He chaired the Wannsee Conference in January 1942, where the systematic extermination of Jews was formalized. Under Heydrich's direction, the SS implemented a plan that led to the deaths of six million Jews, along with millions of others who were deemed undesirable by the Nazis. In addition to his role in the Holocaust, Heydrich was also responsible for the brutal repression of resistance in Nazi-occupied territories. As the Reich protector of Bohemia and Moravia, he ruled with an iron fist, earning his nickname the Butcher of Prague. His policies of mass executions and deportations were aimed at crushing any dissent and cementing Nazi control over the region. Heydrich's reign of terror was cut short on May 27, 1942, when he was attacked by Czech resistance fighters in Prague. Severely wounded in the ambush, he died from his injuries on June 4, 1942. The Nazi regime responded to his assassination with brutal reprisals, including the destruction of the village of Lidice and the execution of thousands of Czechs. Heydrich's death was a significant blow to the Nazi leadership but his legacy of violence and genocide endured. His role in the Holocaust and the repression of occupied Europe made him one of the most reviled figures of the Nazi regime. Despite his relatively short life, Heydrich left an indelible mark on history as one of the principal architects of the Nazi terror. Hi, soldiers. Just a quick reminder. 85% of you who watch our videos aren't subscribed yet. If you enjoy our content, make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss an update. That's an order. Albert Speer, the Nazi architect and minister of armaments. 
Albert Speer, often referred to as Hitler's architect, was a man of contradictions. As the chief architect of the Third Reich and later its Minister of Armaments, Speer played a crucial role in both the construction of Nazi Germany's grandiose structures and the war machine that kept it alive. However, unlike many of his Nazi contemporaries, Speer managed to distance himself from the most heinous crimes of the regime and later expressed remorse for his actions. But how sincere was this remorse, and to what extent was Speer truly complicit? Albert Speer was born on March 19, 1905, into an affluent middle-class family in Mannheim, Germany. His early life was characterized by a strong interest in architecture, and he pursued his studies at the prestigious Technical University of Berlin. In 1931, Speer joined the Nazi party, drawn to its promise of national renewal and the charismatic leadership of Adolf Hitler. Speer's talent as an architect quickly brought him to Hitler's attention. He was tasked with designing some of the most iconic structures of the Third Reich, including the Nuremberg Rally Grounds and the new Reich Chancellery in Berlin. Speer's work embodied the Nazi ideals of power, order, and grandeur, and he became one of Hitler's closest confidants. The two men shared a vision of transforming Berlin into a world capital, with Speer designing massive monumental buildings that would symbolize the might of the Nazi regime. In 1942, following the death of Fritz Taut in a plane crash, Speer was appointed Minister of Armaments and War Production. In this role, he was responsible for overseeing the production of weapons and military supplies, a critical position as Germany became increasingly embroiled in World War II. Speer proved to be an efficient and innovative administrator, managing to significantly increase armament production despite the worsening war situation. He introduced reforms that streamlined the war economy, allowing Germany to continue fighting even as Allied bombing raids intensified. However, Speer's role in the Nazi regime was not limited to architecture and armaments. He was also implicated in the use of forced labor, as millions of prisoners of war, concentration camp inmates, and civilian workers from occupied territories were exploited to maintain German production. Although Speer later claimed that he was unaware of the full extent of the atrocities being committed, Evidence suggests that he was at least partially aware of the conditions under which this labor was being used. After the war, Speer was one of the few high-ranking Nazis to express remorse for his actions. At the Nuremberg trials, he famously stated that he accepted responsibility for the regime's crimes, though he denied having direct knowledge of the Holocaust. His willingness to admit guilt, combined with his portrayal of himself as a technocrat, who was more focused on architecture and administration than ideology, helped him avoid the death penalty. Instead, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. During his time in Spandau prison, Speer wrote several books, including his memoirs, Inside the Third Reich, in which he provided a detailed account of his time within the Nazi hierarchy. His writings contributed to the myth of the good Nazi, a portrayal that has been heavily criticized by historians who argue that Speer's claims of ignorance and remorse were largely self-serving. Speer was released from prison in 1966 and lived a relatively quiet life until his death in 1981. His legacy remains controversial. While some view him as a repentant figure who took responsibility for his actions, others see him as a skilled manipulator who evaded full accountability for his role in one of history's darkest regimes. Albert Speer's life story raises difficult questions about guilt, responsibility, and the nature of evil. Was he a mere technocrat who was swept up in the machinery of a totalitarian state, or was he an active participant in its crimes? The answer to this question continues to be debated, but what is clear is that Speer played a key role in the functioning of the Nazi regime, and his work had a lasting impact on the course of history. Martin Bormann, The Power Behind the Throne Martin Bormann, often referred to as Hitler's shadow, was one of the most enigmatic and powerful figures in the Nazi hierarchy. Although he operated mostly behind the scenes, Bormann's influence was far-reaching, controlling access to Hitler and managing the day-to-day -day affairs of the Nazi party with ruthless efficiency. But how did this man, who was rarely seen in public, become one of the most powerful figures in the Third Reich? Martin Bormann was born on June 17, 1900, in Wegeleben, Germany. His early life was unremarkable, marked by a short stint in the German army during World War I and a period of involvement in far-right paramilitary groups during the chaotic years that followed the war. It was during this time that Bormann was imprisoned for his role in the murder of a former teacher suspected of being a spy, 
an experience that further radicalized him. Bormann joined the Nazi party in 1927, and his early work within the organization was largely administrative. However, his keen organizational skills and unwavering loyalty quickly caught the attention of senior Nazi officials. In 1933, after the Nazis came to power, Bormann became the chief of staff to Rudolf Hess, the deputy Fuhrer. This position put him in the heart of the Nazi power structure, where he began to build a network of influence that would serve him well in the years to come. Bormann's real rise to power began in 1941, when Rudolf Hess made his ill-fated flight to Scotland in an attempt to negotiate peace with Britain. With Hess now out of the picture, Bormann stepped into the power vacuum, becoming the head of the Nazi party chancellery. In this role, he became Hitler's private secretary, controlling access to the Fuhrer and managing his schedule, correspondence, and even personal finances. What made Bormann so powerful was his proximity to Hitler. He became the gatekeeper to the Fuhrer, and by controlling who could see or speak to Hitler, Bormann effectively controlled the flow of information to and from the Nazi leader. He used this power to sideline rivals and consolidate his influence over the party and the state. Bormann was also a key figure in the implementation of Nazi policies, particularly those related to the war effort and the persecution of Jews and other minorities. He was deeply involved in the administration of the occupied territories and played a significant role in the exploitation of forced labor. His administrative skills were crucial in maintaining the machinery of the Nazi state, even as the war began to turn against Germany. Despite his immense power, Bormann remained largely unknown to the German public. He rarely appeared in public and was content to let others take the spotlight, all the while pulling the strings behind the scenes. His ability to operate in the shadows made him one of the most effective and feared figures in the Nazi hierarchy. As the war drew to a close, Bormann remained by Hitler's side in the Fuhrer bunker in Berlin. In the chaotic final days of the Third Reich, Bormann attempted to maintain order, even as the regime crumbled around him. After Hitler's suicide on April 30, 1945, Bormann fled the bunker in an attempt to escape the advancing Soviet forces. He was last seen near the Lerder railway station in Berlin, and for many years, his fate remained a mystery. It wasn't until 1972 that Bormann's remains were discovered near the spot where he was last seen, confirming that he had died in May 1945, likely from suicide or an attempt to evade capture. His death marked the end of one of the most secretive and powerful careers in the Nazi regime. Martin Bormann's legacy is one of manipulation, control, and a relentless pursuit of power. While he may not have been as visible as other members of Hitler's inner circle, his influence was profound. Bormann's ability to operate behind the scenes and his control over Hitler's inner workings made him one of the most dangerous men in the Third Reich. Conclusion As we've seen, the men in Hitler's inner circle were not just followers. They were key players who shaped and executed the twisted vision of the Nazi regime. Their actions left a legacy of destruction and horror that the world is still reckoning with today. Understanding their stories isn't just about looking back at history. It's a reminder of the dangers of unchecked power, blind loyalty, and the human capacity for evil. Let these stories serve as a warning and a call to remain vigilant against the forces that seek to divide and destroy. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts in the comments. Check back in again soon. Salute.